again when we talk about this i think there are many models that that helps us to 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 conceptualize these western welfare states you think the the western states especially nordic maybe you are referring to the nordic states are more institutional when we say institutional they are universal services okay what about uk or us because these are the the states are discussed you know everyone wants to be there or you know i think everyone has a praise for the us uh, social security system or number or whatever you know everyone will have a number india also started doing that now a unique identification number through which i think your ic number or whatever in malaysia they also have done that what do you think about that they are institutional or they are different if they different why they were different you know why you know uh, uh, denmark have you know opted for an institutional type whereas uh, uk or uh, you know uh, netherlands you know have opted for something else why was that if all politicians wanted to win back you know popular support why they have come up with different policies different models different combinations they all wanted to do one, one thing they want to win back they wanted to win the elections they wanted in you know, a popular support they wanted votes so for that what all they have done you know uh, to me this is a very close relation you know when we are discussing social policy welfare state there is something i think we need to really remember is the politics and the political parties and their ideologies i think we can see the connection right even in beverage report or you know the british welfare state after 1940s 45 you know how the labor party you know has influenced the policies or in and in the case of uh, uh, us the democrats and republicans you know when when bush becomes a uh, president what kind of policies that you can expect when uh, another you know obama becomes a uh, 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 president what kind of policies you can expect you know they have their own ideologies and people vote on these ideologies and the presidents or the prime ministers try to stick to these ideologies they maneuver in between but still they try to stick to the the ideologies and win popular support so what is the relationship between political parties social democratic or republican or conservative or in malaysia i don't know how they how they democratic left center or right center whatever what is the relationship between a political party and its ideology and the social policy and welfare state like this do you see connection connections if you say that so social policy in a particular country is this immediately we can see the type of welfare state the type of policies in place the type of uh, political party in power or in the even the opposition you know plays an important role in this if you know if you have a very strong opposition party can you see these links i think that's very important all these discussions i think they are related the beverage report you know beverage is already a, a bureaucrat working very close to labor party titmus you know work, work, was working in uh, uh, london school of economics so your party ideology your own disciplinary you know uh, uh, notions all that related on um, reflected into your policy and then you know the kind of welfare state that we are discussing could you see the connections i think it's very important to you know to internalize these connections for example malaysia you know it was a mahathir time it was different now it is different maybe in future if there is a different political party or the same political party with a different ideology then you will see different policies so i think all these things that we've been discussing same bismarck he was a you know statesman a politician he came up with social insurance model in germany a particular historical time why he came up with you know that particular social insurance model or spencer a uk sociologist who has a, a big impact on on the on the on the government and it, and the way you know the 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 government has been structured and his ideas have been taken up a uh, frank word lester frank word known as a modern architect of uh, uh, welfare state in us who is this guy what were his ideas you know how he could influence many presidents and presidential you know um uh, uh, what do you call uh, declarations beverage uk we studied little bit asping anderson all of them i think there are many more actually i have not taken those names but these are influential figures they have their own models tested they have traveled everywhere these ideas have traveled to other countries they have taken from the others so i think when we want to conceptualize when we want to understand how 
how people have conceptualized. I think there are, uh, these people are behind and their ideas are there. So that is what we will try and achieve today. How the modern welfare states came about. In Britain, there was some reason, maybe in UK, in, 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 in Sweden, there must be some other reason. How actually these modern welfare states actually got birth, got, you know, what was the genesis, how they came actually, you know, and how they were evolved into the current complexity that we've been discussing. So these are two things. Maybe there are other ways that we can conceptualize. Who are all the people behind? What were the ro uh, role of political parties? So there is many ways of conceptualizing. But maybe very simple way is to do this, to ask these two important questions. How the modern welfare state has been emerged in a particular you know, country or a region? And how it evolved to its current complexity? In many countries, maybe we can still you know, negotiate or argue whether that state is welfare or not welfare, you know, what, what level it has been uh, achieved. But in Western context, I think we can ask this, how the, our particular welfare state evolved to its current complexity? What were the reasons? So this, this is one way to conceptualize. It helps to conceptualize. It helps to basically further understand the very notion of welfare state, its functioning, its challenges, its, uh, uh, its uh, working. Problems of conceptualization of welfare state change or welfare state change, welfare state reforms, they can only be solved by distinguishing between different dimensions of change. So yes, change is there. They've been changing all the states in Nordic countries, USA, US, UK, Australia, New Zealand. They, all these states are evolving. They're also you know, evolving to a complex situation. They're changing. And how do we capture this change? I think that's what the comparison. When you are comparing, we are comparing actually, you know, a level of services, a level of, you know, their, uh, their functioning. So how do we can, how, how, how can we capture that? We can capture that by distinguishing between the different dimensions of change. In each of these cases, you know, we can see that. What changes, what are those dimensions of change that we can, we can study, we can compare, so that we will understand better a particular welfare state and its functioning in a particular you know, region. There are four dimensions, even to study change, uh, the scholars have further divided into four things. When we are talking about change, welfare state and its change, it was very, very you know, institutional but now it became redistributive or you know, it became corporatist, it became very conservative. What changes you know, it took place? So when we study dimensions of change, so these are the four things that are important for us. What are the level of change? Okay, there is change. But what kind of or what levels of this change? What direction it change took place? It was institutional in the beginning and now it is very liberal. What direction the change? Change took place, but what direction? It was very redistributive or liberal state, but now it became very institutional. The change is very different, for example. Now the Nordic countries, they are rolling back. It was a very institutional, social democratic kind of welfare state. Universal, you know, policies, universal, you know, coverage. But even now they are rolling back because of the reforms, financial implications, globalization. So they are slowly becoming maybe more uh, corporatist or conservative where uh, achievement, you know, matters, performance matters. Or they may become one day a liberal ones like US, what we are saying now. Even US, though we say liberal, is it really liberal? That's what you know some literature is asking. US is a very federal nature. Federal, you have states and you have districts. So they're very complex system. So they're saying that it's a very complex liberal, you know, system. So they're changing. So how do we capture this change as scholars? What is that we you know we will look at? The level of change the whole country or it's only one state in the US, the state's different, right? Each state has its own you know, laws and legislations and tax systems. So when we are talking about welfare state policies, for example, US, what level of changes have taken place in all states or only in few states or only one state? Direction of change, what direction is it taking, you know? Uh, a dynamics of change, 
who are the main players for 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 for, for this change is it uh, president uh, obama or is it uh, opposition party or it is republican lobby or it is uh, grassroots movements or what are these dynamics of change is it black is it white race you know the dynamics of change and the degree of change what is the you know degree of change everything happened but nothing has changed again it has come back to you know uh, so this is a very interesting i thought for studying even for comparing later so how do we conceptualize we can conceptualize by the level of changes that took place in a particular welfare state in last 20 years how do we assess this change the level of change the direction of change and the dynamics of change and the degree of change what an interesting you know uh, uh, scholarship what do you think we will go into these details what is this you know i'm just giving you the 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 the, the very superficial you know very the first level of you know uh, understanding do you think with this we will have we will be able to have a certain conceptualization or a certain notions or certain whatever you call framework certain idea about a welfare state for example you want to study welfare state in singapore how do you start where do you start we want to compare right that's our goal we want to compare welfare states well social policies in four or five countries so what i'm doing all these weeks is preparing you and me to have a a framework so that we can compare and we can you know study so in that i think conceptualizing welfare state becomes very important how do we conceptualize how, what is the, what is your understanding about welfare state in singapore if i ask to say something about singapore and its welfare state what you will say you i'm sure you know about a lot about singapore is it a welfare state or not of course yes what kind of welfare state hmm ha huh? residual welfare it only talks about people you know who can't people's needs who cannot be met by the family and the market and the state comes in okay you think it is very residual or what else what is your impression about uh, about the, the the welfare state in singapore let's say i am not using conceptualization the moment you say conceptualization there are many things just our general understanding common sense it more it's more about industrial achievement kind of model you know you work you get lot of uh, uh, salary you get lot of benefits okay that's your idea your conceptualization about singapore or singapore welfare state our friend uh, sleeping okay well, what do you think about uh, japan ha huh? how do you conceptualize welfare state in japan more just common sense what do you how do you see uh, you know organized. very organized okay maybe american tell us something about malaysia what do you think what is your idea about uh, the welfare state in uh, i come back to you uh, uh, about malaysia so well fair state but what kind now we are classifying them right yeah, so that you know we can put them attack there you know this is my idea about welfare state in singapore according to him it was very residual according to her it is a very achievement based you know performance based model about uh, malaysia i'm sure we have ideas we know little bit about this if you ask anyone they will tell you even they don't know i think about the anderson you know classification regimes this and that hmm okay it is going towards residual look so you are saying it is going towards residual it used to be maybe very institutional and uh, social democratic but now because of global forces crisis whatever we are moving towards residual you have this already you know 
you have this already you are making already a statement you have already this idea this notion if you want to study further okay we, now we can look at this what the changes are happening even malaysia singapore changes are happening what level is it in one state sabah sarawak or is it whole malaysia what kind of dynamics what is the direction it is taking now what you said is actually direction you know from a institutional welfare it is going towards residual maybe you lack data to prove this or you will prove this so basically you are using direction of change to explain the very notion of you know your welfare state so these four things that we been discussed you see in the literature very useful to conceptualize the the kind of you know a welfare state that exists in a particular country in a particular time we'll go into details i will come back to this slide at the end so that you know how this is useful for us we will be able to see also you know we saw other uh, uh, others work for example decommodification it also helps to conceptualize to place a welfare state in a particular scale you know on a particular uh, 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 graph decommodification it helps to extend to which welfare production was available independently of the market forces so when we are talking about decommodification it's a civil right that you get the welfare it's not a uh, dole or it's not something you know uh, that you should be shamed of and also levels of stratification what is this levels of stratification the extent to which access to welfare was structured by social class what is this you understood decommodification that also helps us for example maybe in singapore uh, uh, when you say it's residual the decommodification is if it is low then people should be able to live without the market's help it is very high it, it, in, in singapore i think uh to extend the welfare protection was given to a particular person or a particular citizen without the market's force basically not the countries the decommodification is very low levels of stratification the extent to which access to welfare was structured by social class what is this what do you understand this you belong to particular social class and your access to welfare is you know determined by that you see this in malaysia maybe a little bit or maybe other places that is called levels of stratification how the society is stratified how the social class you know uh, uh, functioning the extent to which access to welfare was structured by your social class blacks in us you know they all supposed to be on government welfare because there's something called welfare mothers you know you are unwedded you are you are you are not married uh, you have children you have to you know take care you are not employed so there is a welfare for you so your social class and the access to welfare also gives us and how much you can do it in a particular country what do you think in in singapore do you think uh, unwedded mothers or you know mothers who are single widowed and uh, how, how how are they you know helped or protected by the state what kind of policies do they have what kind of welfare mechanisms do they you know mobilize compared to the same uh, women in malaysia for example who is better located who is better positioned imagine there is a woman who is unwedded three children no job malaysia singapore and indonesia who is better placed just guess we don't have a evidence here what do you think maybe in indonesia i don't know or in malaysia or in singapore so the level of access the legislation you know the kind of legislation that you have encouraging or discouraging this particular you know phenomena for example maybe in malaysia uh, do you think they they have some welfare mechanism they 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 are a target group by jkm or someone they they, they known you know so they have given some support mechanisms maybe in indonesia it's still not there there's no no special provisions we don't know we have to find out so the your social class and the access to welfare even that could give us a lot of insights into the very, very nature of welfare state so that we we could we could uh, we could conceptualize or we could develop our understanding about welfare state what do you think do you think it helps the levels of stratification they call it levels of stratification how in a particular country 
the society is stratified and you know uh, uh, in terms of social class and who is having access for what kind of welfare services do you think that gives us some idea about a welfare state in a particular country it does at least to me think about that now we will see some of these uh, models proposed by these guys and we'll see how they have used these uh, ideas you have heard about bismarck in 1980s his social insurance programs were the first in the world and became the model for others countries on the basis of the modern welfare state for the basis of the welfare state or it, this became the basis for a modern welfare state what we mean by that a modern welfare state in 19th century itself the beginning of the 19th century or the mid of the 19th century so he came up with these three laws health insurance 1883 accident insurance 1884 old age and disability insurance in 1889 in germany why he had to do this there are a lot of people who are trying to immigrate trying to go to us for better wages whereas welfare did not exist at that time in us that's what he says and the the, the literature shows that he had to come up with these things he convinced the industrialist in the germany saying that look you guys have to come up with all this otherwise your workers will leave you know your production will go down so that's why we see germany what kind of model that we see in germany now industrial achievement performance industrial you know that kind of model the you can see the origins are right from here so for germany it is a social insurance everyone has to go to work everyone is given an employment opportunity everyone is placed in the in the in the whole structure you know everyone got a job everyone contributes according to your contribution you will also get the insurance benefits it's changing now but initially it was the the idea the very idea of social insurance you can see 18 you know uh, middle middle of the 19th century when he came up with these things 1883 1884 and 1889 the last quarter of the 19th century hmm and now we see its implications in the modern german welfare state still those 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 issues are there you know it attaches uh, 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 a place for you you know where you are working what kind of work you are doing how much are you contributing you know uh, wh- how is your performance or what is your achievements the state will provide you uh, employment or uh, uh, other training program so that you can go you know uh, one step further you know you can contribute more the whole uh, insurance or welfare mechanism based on where you are working with whom are working at what level you are working so the social status you know basically the levels of stratification I think we can see it here. If you can, if you want to understand the German welfare state, even now, I think it helps. You know, if you study the social class, social structure, the levels, you know, the kind of welfare mechanisms or welfare uh, measures that they are entitled to, it helps us. So there are three things that in the German model that we can see: the social market, the social insurance model, social market. Interesting. See. The, there is still the industry the state is there but industry also plays an important role the social market model there are three principles here the first and the central principle was the economic development is the best way i think now malaysia is najib is saying the same thing when they when they talking about welfare state it is the economics economic development you know plays a central role to achieve social welfare in a particular country and german i think you still see that why why do you think that the economic development and we also see that economic development may not really lead you know social development you know there are many examples that we have but in this model they say that the central principle was the economic development the structure of social services had to reflect this priority the the, the economic development which uh, the first principle the principle is represented most clearly in the close relationship of services to people's position in the labor market people's position in the labor market you are a manager you are a you are a ceo you are a worker you are a blue collar worker you are a white collar worker your your position in the labor market determines what social welfare measures that you will be entitled to social benefits are earnings related how much you earn how much you contribute so your social benefits are also you know correlated to that and with 
and those without work records may find they are not covered for important contingencies. You know, we are talking about the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So if you are not working, you are not entitled to these services. Second, the German economy and the welfare system developed through a corporatist structure. That is what corporate, conservative or social corporate model that we discussed. This principle was developed by Bismarck on the basis of existing mutual aid associations that time and remained the basis for social production subsequently. And he, he got the ideas and applied to the industry and the employer-employee you know, relationships. Social insurance which covers the cost of health of the workers, some social care, much of the income maintenance system is managed by a system of independent funds. The third principle is principle of subsidiarity. 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 Subsi, subs, subsidiarity. Subsidiarity. Subsidy. Subsidiarity. Subsidies and subsidiarity. Okay. What is subsidiarity? Subsidiarity. The principle is taken in German to mean both that services should be decentralized subsidiary you know the services should be decentralized or independently managed and that the level of state that is limited to circumstances which are not adequately covered in other ways subsidiary for example your uh, JK what is that health you have I was talking about this all the time the state money is there the state is funded this particular health system in Malaysia it's called JK hospitals or uh, JKM hospitals or something like that. I think it's from the state of Selanga. Invested a lot of money into this corporate hospitals. It is a state funded but it is a private or corporate you know, hospital. You heard about that? There are private hospitals, there are government hospitals. But there is something in between. It's funded by the government funds, the state funds. But it's managed as a private uh, 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 entity. When you go to those hospitals, you have to pay at least, you know, a little bit more uh, what you would be paying in the state. So, sub subsidi subsidiarity is basically all the services are decentralized, health, education, whatever, but the state still play a role which is residual. It's not like entirely withdrawing that. So, the third principle in German model is the principle it's taken is to mean both services should be decentralized or independently managed whereas the state still play a residual role limited to the circumstances which are not adequately covered in other ways by market or, or no, uh, mutual aid or, or other ways of you know um, other mechanisms are failed then the state will come into picture. So it, it plays in still an important role there. Higher earners are not covered by the main social insurance, though they contribute, but they, they have to make their own arrangements. Subsidiarity is basically, to me it is, uh, um, why, why, what do you think about this? Why, you know, this is an important thing. It's, it is, uh, services are decentralized, but at the same time state plays an important role. It's not entirely to the market, entirely to the, to the, to the financial, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms. So there are three things. One, the economics, the economic development is a must and people's place in the labor market decides their access to social welfare. Two, social insurance which covers the cost of health, some social care, much of the income maintenance system is managed by a system of independent funds. You know, you have health fund, you have uh, different funds, you know. And three, the principle of subs subsidiarity, you know. The, the, the services are decentralized, but the state play an important role. What do you think? There are three things here. Economic development is top priority. You have to, every worker, you know, has a place in the labor market. It creates employment opportunities for everyone. And everyone has to work and contribute. Two, a system of independent funds. Three, the principle of subsidiarity. So three together, so what kind of you know welfare mechanism that we can think of? Uh, 
Private NGOs, yes, that is there. Yeah, for example, look at uh, Penang uh, water system, water facility. It is funded or, you know, the still the ownership is with the state, but it is by a private agency, right? I think in Penang, that is how it is. That's why I think the water distribution reaches 99%. The collection is, you know, better. Electricity, toll gates. Yeah, I understand public-private partnerships, public, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, we see all those, you know, now. But if you look at the German model, the insurance model or the, the, lab, the social market model is three things. Economic development is a must. Everyone has to work. You have a place in the labor market. The, the, the state creates employment opportunities. Your earnings are related to the, 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 your social welfare access or social welfare benefits are related to your earnings. Two, there is a system of independent funds. Three, the principle of subsidiarity where the subsidiary units or you know sub you know the, what i understood is that the services are decentralized they are not saying privatized decentralized uh, but the state still play a role even if it is a residual role you know when it, it comes into picture where other mechanisms are adequately not covered it comes into this whereas high earners have the flexibility or are expected to maintain their own social insurance and uh, left to make their own arrangements where still poor or uh, other classes are still covered. So, this is what we can go on. We will see the German model here. We will read a little bit more about But this is the basic, the rudimentary form. I mean, when they were talking about welfare state in 18 or middle, mid 19th century, these three principles, I think they followed. Uh, one, one very important person is Herbert Spencer. You can see again. Same time, 1820, you know, the beginning of the 19th century. We are talking about 100 years ago. Huh? 100 years ago, people have, it's not even, you know, really the welfare state, the 1950s, you know, we have seen the very uh, origin of, uh, very evolution or very, the development of welfare state. But even before that, you know, we saw the, 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 saw the, saw the you know, uh, the, 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 the seeds you know, in these discussions. Herbert Spencer, a single most famous European intellectual. He is known as a social Darwinist because he believes survival of the fittest. Even before, I think Aristotle, he said that. Before even that, he, he said this, but not uh, very famous about that. But people now recognize him as a social Darwinist. Darwinism is survival of the fittest. You know, people who fit, physically fit, they survive, you know others will die. Social Darwinist model that applied the law of survival of the fittest to the society. He says coddling, you know, to be overprotective, the poor, the unfit would simply allow them to reproduce and delay the social progress. Basically he says you should not spend much on the you know, poor and the deforming. You should not protect them much because it will slow the, you know, uh, the development. It's, it delays the social progress. So they only produce, reproduce, but it delays the social progress. What is this idea? Can you now say the connection between this guy and a particular, you know, classif a cl particular type of welfare state? Survival of the fittest. You know? People who are fit only survive. Competition. Growth. Progress. You know? What kind of welfare state you can think of from this kind of ideas. Industrial? Okay. What else? What is liberal states? Hmm? Competition, progress, achievement. To me, I think there is a connection between these kind of ideas and the liberal welfare state that we are talking about now. Or even residual, for example. Look at that. The single most famous, you know, fellow in the whole of European, you know, uh, uh, region, and uh, he's known as social Darwinist. I can, you can go on. You can read a little bit of his work. Basically, he also talks about human progress and liberty, you know, 
nothing should be under the state is remember he is talking about in the beginning of the you know 19th century spencer proposed abolishing government welfare that time elizabethan poor laws and many you know britain was going through that all kind of colonialism you know all kind of expansion so he came up with saying that abolishing government welfare is a must all trade restrictions government education government church subsidies medical licensing the government postal monopoly the central bank the legal tender laws overseas colonies non defensive wars all that you know abolishing free you know freedom human liberty the humans can progress very well when you, when you don't have restrictions if you read about his work i think that is what comes to you otherwise why you should say that you know government should abolish welfare abolish all the trade restrictions remember that time the slavery you know there a lot of laws you know a lot of people brought into you know so he was saying this spencer explains that the the sentiments developed that induce people to respect others spencer explains that is basically the idea behind is that humans have sentiments they have respect to others others natural rights and the highest level of social evolution to voluntarily advance the welfare of other individuals so you don't need to do anything just give them freedom give them liberty you know they will advance they will progress but don't over protect the poor and the unfit it will slow down the progress so basically he's saying one way humanity you know they have its in inherent values but at the same time i think he's saying almost it is the people who work hard people who can fit people who can you know uh work hard think whatever can actually contribute to the progress it has connections with the liberal state that we've been discussing now so spencer and his ideas are very influential that time uk and he came up with many books the man versus the state written in 1884 reproduced in 1860 1960 you can see that herbert spencer the british philosopher and sociologist was prominent for his ideas in the 19th century the late 19th century his defender of individual freedom and he is a critic of state violence and coercion you know the state should play a very minimal role give freedom give you know uh, natural rights so that humans will progress i think some of this liberal ideology or liberal states that we see now may be talking about this see the connection like that you have lester frankwood from us he is a us sociologist and american sociologist who had a great impact he is known as the modern architect of welfare state in us what was his ideas he is very instrumental in establishing sociology as a discipline in us of course us is a country of slaves and uh, the settlers so you can understand what kind of you know uh, the social structures so he said the sociology is the 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 fundamental science or social science which helps to advance the society so he kind of helped sociology or argued academic discipline in as sociology as an academic discipline in the united states his belief that a universal and a comprehensive system of education was necessary if a democratic government was successfully to function talking about education access to education education you know uh, 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 its connections with the liberation enlightenment you know progressivism so he is basically a, as a sociologist arguing for universal and comprehensive education to me it is a very welfare provision now all the governments are now talking about free and compulsory primary education whereas he was saying that you know 100 years ago a profound influence on a young generation of progressive thinkers and politicians whose work culminated into the president frank roosevelt's new deal 1930s we will discuss about that so how these guys ideas about progressivism education sociology you know kind of influenced some of these us presidents and the kind of you know uh, uh, legislations that they brought in you know he talks about relief recovery and reform the welfare state policies of the us in 1930s i think the social security act in us came in 1935 or 1945 you know that's a very historic legislation which talks about you know social security for all in the us 
So, what is his idea? His idea was social liberalism. He's talking about there are classical liberalism, social liberalism, neoliberalism, and liberalism. There are very you know variations. You can now people are talking about neoliberalism, right? So we need to understand what is this liberalism? What is liberalization? What is this neoliberalization? You know, we, th those roots you can see, you know, 100 years ago. So, Ward's system, and he's different from classical liberalism. You know, how it is different, I will explain. So, he says, he, he, he's a proponent of social liberalism. His emphasis was on social functioning rather, and planning rather than social structuring. Whereas Marxism talks about social structure, the class. Whereas liberalism the, or, the, or, the, or the social liberalism talks about social functioning and planning rather than social structure. Can you see the difference? When you are putting focus on social structures, class, power, you know, you are getting into somewhere else, another debate. Where you, whether you are focusing on social functioning and planning, you are talking something else. So, social liberalism talks about social functioning and planning rather than social structure. It has a considerable effect on, you know, uh, uh, people like uh, Beblen and the institutional economists later. So basically, uh, what I'm trying to kind of share with you guys here is, look at these sociologists or these, you know, ideas and it's the very con idea, the connection to the, uh, the welfare state discussion that we are doing now. So what do you think? What kind of welfare state you would have come up with? So his ideas are, have profound impact on the administrations of uh, Roose Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Frank uh, D. Roosevelt uh, on, on the modern democratic party and their ideas. At the age of 42, he wrote a lot of books. He published two important books, Dynamic Sociology and formalized the basic tenets of social liberalism while at the same time attacking the the lesser fair policies advocated by Herbert Spencer. We just discussed Herbert Spencer talking about, you know, the lesser role for the state. Whereas he's talking about, you know, social liberalism. The state should play an important role. Look at this. UK, US, you know, those are the centers where a lot of ideas were, you know, borrowed, exchanged, debated. Even social work we see, you know, there's a lot of models from UK and US. The, the, the evolution of social work you know, the US model and UK model. Actually, many people from US came to UK, learned some, you know, ideas, went back to US, tested, and that's how we came up with the different methods. You can see that happening here also, in, in the social policy arena also. So, the, whereas Spencer argued for lesser role for the state, that's what he says. Freedom, you know, the state should not uh, put any effort on welfare. Whereas, you know, Frank Wood, you know, believed in education, universal education, comprehensive system of education and state should play an important role and it had implications on, on presidents like this. Maybe it changed now. That's a different thing. The Teddy, the, the, the Theodore Roosevelt and of course I think same family, I think his niece, the Franklin Roosevelt, I think very famous with the New Deal. What is this New Deal in 1930s? We will discuss later. But maybe just go through this. Uh, what kind of D, I mean, uh, ideas they came up with and how, what is the connection between words, uh, social liberalism and uh, these presidents. Whereas now, Presidents Bush and others, you know, Republicans, newer liberalism ideas. That's also an idea, you know. So, how in US these ideologies influenced uh, 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 either democratic or uh, Republican parties, when they come to power, how they have influenced social policies and the kind of welfare state. So it's been changing, is it? That's what we, we, can, uh, we can conclude. When there is Republicans, they have a neoliberal ideology and they have, you know, uh, 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 similar social policies and you can see uh, maybe more residual or more liberal state. Whereas a, Democra uh, a Democrat uh, is in power, you still say the same thing or you see the changes? Even within the US, what I'm trying to do it here is, though in the US, I mean in the, in the literature we see US as a liberal model. It's not the same, that's what you know, I'm trying to do it here. Within that particular model you see changes. 
Why those changes? Because you have a particular party in power and they have their, their own ideology and roots. Simple classical liberalism or social liberalism and neoliberalism. They're different. And when, when a particular political party come into power and their ideology, you know, influences the social policy and it changes the very nature of the welfare state. That's what I'm trying to tell. Though we group a particular state into a particular classification, but we still see the, you know, the shade, different shades and colors of it. So we have to be careful on that. Okay, William Henry Beveridge, you heard about this guy. Again, I'm bringing the same slide. You know, he's an economist. See? Very influence, you know, a lot of influence on the British welfare state and it's, it's, a, it's a current form, for example. Again, born in 18th century. The second or third half of the 18th century, 19th century. Hmm? He's an economist, he's also a social reformer. He left his civil service to become the director of the London School of Economics. Wrote a lot of books. He is influenced by basically, you know, the social insurance and allied services. The word social insurance. Learned a lot of, you know, things from the Germany, the Bismarck model. You know, known 42 report, known as Beveridge Report, which became the fundamental, you know, document for the modern British welfare state, which served as the basis for the post-World War II welfare state in Britain. You know, we also discussed these five evils. I think you remember this, right? So where, where he got, as an economist, his own experiences, you know, things that are happening in other countries, you know, he put all together as a beverage report and he talked about the five Jains. I think this is a new slide, you have not seen this. A British leaflet of the Liberal Party expressing support for the National Insurance Act of 1911. So National Health Agency came later, 1945, I think, after the Britain. But these were the, you know, the, the roots. National Health Insurance Act, 1911. This legislation provided benefits to sick and unemployed workers, making a major milestone in the development of social welfare. Look at that pamphlet. Hmm? Disablement against sickness and disablement. National national insurance or something like that support the liberal government and the policy of social reform this is a you know pamphlet they were you know distributing maybe for in support of people so you have an idea you ask for a people's support popular support to come into power and then you implement once you come into power and then we saw there's this five uh, this beverage model uh, based on social insurance and allied services while it focused mainly on social insurance what Americans think of a social security is more, the, these words also keep changing, interchanging. The report also articulated the right of anyone to receive health care, irrespective of your social, your position in a labor market. That's, that is the difference between the, the, the German model and the UK model, for example. It says, it focused mainly on social insurance or social security for everyone. You know, it's a right of anyone to receive health care on the basis of a clinical need regardless of ability to pay or gave rise to a health care system known as beverage model. They are struggling with that but still I think in, in UK still you see more or less a similar uh, same system even now. It is a, it's a universal coverage irrespective of your ability to pay. Maybe you have to wait longer hours or you, can, you can't choose a hospital, you can't choose a doctor whatever but still you know. Uh, uh, it covers everyone, though there are very, uh, you know, variations and uh, modifications. But the idea is, it's a universal coverage. You also saw uh, Richard Titmus, who who advanced social policy as a discipline. He played an important role in establishing, you know, uh, uh, as an academic discipline, social policy and administration. His thinking and writing, you know, also shaped the British welfare state. We also discussed about this. Esping Anderson, we also discussed about this. Uh, Danish sociologist, he came up with the huge work. He still continue doing this. He came up with these three classifications, the liberal welfare, the social democratic, and the corporate welfare. What made them to believe you know, it works? Remember what all they started with? They started with the women and employment. Huh? Then uh, what else they said? Huh? 
the, the home visit the health care a nurse was visiting her you know the, the home care and then the children the school and how all the children you know uh, the, the, the child care services are taken for, taken carefully for women to work then and the home care issue you know how it has been you know funded or how they were not moving to hospitals you know as long as they want to stay in their own home it's called home care expensive but that shows the well being or the you know the, the aspirations are huh? the other stay and then it also creates more jobs you know people to go there to you know then then they talked about uh, at the end they talked about immigration migrants and their role in the economy and the crime and and in between us all they were talking about i think um, what else There's so many things they've touched the health education housing they haven't touched i think little bit on the community the settlements and what else hmm a uh, social enterprise how you know the economic opportunities employment opportunities how even immigrants can contribute the especially women and their participation in the labor force what else the pensions yes in between i think they talked about the pensions and how the pension structure you know uh, 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 is still uh, working and then i think they also talked about age care you know the aging and the pensions what else i think I'd, if you see that article the paper in this book by p talcock <clears throat> and uh, gary you know i think the same thing they've started with the same sentence what they have started here the sweden the between between it's a between uh, it's a marriage between capitalism and socialism the middle way or whatever you know so it's very interesting to see this and uh, the connections that we just discussed anything else you remember from that so now what i propose is that we look at this paper i think in the next half an hour and then we'll close so maybe there are two sets two people can share that and maybe you can make copies and uh, <clears throat> uh before going to the paper maybe a little summary you know you know we looked at the ideology and what is the role of ideology in how do we conceptualize there is a chapter here also i mean if you are interested you can uh, look at this in the first uh, first introductory chapter you know professor alcock says that i'll also show you another video by him whatever the importance of economic political and social pressures on the welfare policy the development of policies in practice depends also upon how the notions of welfare and the need that underpin them are defined and understood this is because different definitions are generated by different ideologies of welfare bismarck you know uh, uh beveridge or titmus or uh, uh, frank what is that the the us yeah the lester frank word so it's basically uh, the this is because different definitions are generated by different ideologies of welfare and ideologies of welfare differ across countries and perhaps more importantly within them all of us operate with ideological perceptions of welfare and need and indeed all other social phenomena however most ideological differences ideological differences what we have seen now uh, ideological differences can be located within the major broad ideological frameworks as i said classical liberalism neo liberalism liberalism social liberalism within one broader framework we can see so many you know different ideologies you know most ideological differences can be located within the major broad ideological frameworks which dominate much theoretical debate about social policy so i think that is what we have done there is a lot of interesting uh things that we can see the the links between the ideology and the and the and the social policy and the nature of social state welfare state that we see now to just to sum up this brings us the question backs to what is this origins you remember 
the origins and then the beginning I showed you a slide the origins and the complexity the level of change towards complexity so maybe this could also help us to understand you know the very nature or uh, development of welfare state a quick historical glance at social reforms in different countries UK US Nordic countries Sweden you know Australia New Zealand Malaysia a quick historical glance at social reforms will you know tell us a notion that welfare state was pursued for egalitarian reasons why welfare state why you know they came up with this welfare state idea why they want to address the poverty why they want to provide housing why they want to create pensions why they want to create jobs why was that if you see the very notions very idea behind this is basically an egalitarian reasons what is egalitarian they want to create a better society they want to create a society where equal opportunities are available where you know equal distribution of you know resources takes place so it's very for egalitarian reasons the very idea of whether it is social democratics or whether it is republicans whether it is uh, democrats the idea is to create an egalitarian society basically to address the poverty address the corruption address the untrust you know to increase the peace and prosperity you know those are the ideas you know so a quick historical glance you know let us know that the very idea behind welfare state is a very egalitarian notion a very egalitarian you know principle to achieve that you might have a residual welfare or a you know a social democratic type of welfare or a you know industrial performance achievement kind of model whatever it is but the very idea is a very egalitarian noble its foundations were typically laid by a conservative reformers like spencer you can see that you know he talks about you know freedom human dignity liberty less you know role for the state like bismarck sought a primarily to reproduce rather than alter prevailing social hierarchies it's a egalitarian notion at the same time the conservative you know thinkers like bismarck statements like bismarck they want to change they want to reproduce they sought in their ideology or in their very you know the idea of constructing a welfare state why they have, what they have guided or what ideas been guided them is they want to reproduce rather than to alter the prevailing social hierarchies they want to reproduce the social hierarchies why was that bismarck was advising you know the industrialist the capitalists to introduce welfare mechanisms to stop workers to you know to go abroad to go to america you know he was actually convincing the the, the employers to create to provide all these facilities you know at the same time you know in the welfare of the workers as a statesman he brought the higher class the so called the capitalists and the you know working class together for a national cause a egalitarian cause you can see that but he, the idea was basically to reproduce rather than restructure or realter the social hierarchies his idea was maintain these hierarchies but again produce wealth you know it's possible that's what the you know the the german model shows to us you know the the employees were happy the employees are also happy because it's a win win kind of situation or everyone gets a piece of cake when the opportunity arose a socialists pushed for social policies democrats pushed for social policies that would better the conditions of workers eliminate poverty and equalize opportunities you know you can see the ideology conservationists they wanted to uh, uh, uh reproduce the social hierarchies without changing much you know that also will maybe you know leads to some unrest or you know some kind of conflict within the society they want to reproduce the social hierarchies but with a egalitarian cause you know for the welfare of the poor or also you know in the interest of the employers and in interest of the and the, the rich class so it is a kind of a you know a mix between you know of both the classes whereas socialists or democrats when there was an opportunity for reform you know they pushed for social policies for what for better conditions eliminate poverty and equalize opportunities if you look at the origins of welfare state the whole thing that we are discussing is basically these are the you know notions behind this from there we start to con conceptualize and the the the, the notion of the, the 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 main principle behind is after all what welfare state is nothing but distribution or redistribution of you know resources what else welfare state is doing 
it's basically you know you collect from some source and you distribute you know some other you know uh, so how welfare states redistribute how they redistribute how, they, how do they distribute is again i think for us an important question to to look into it is useful to distinguish between horizontal and vertical between group redistribution i think we are again getting to one more you know idea welfare state is all about redistribution right you take from the rich give it to poor a robin hood you know kind of story and other that's what welfare states is all about but then how did how does it distributes you know there must be some system there must be some mechanism and there is some scholarship again to understand the very nature of the redistribution within a welfare state and they say that what is the two things a horizontal redistribution and a vertical redistribution what is that any idea welfare state is all about redistribution of resources and how does this the state does it does in two ways one is horizontal and the other one is vertical we'll we'll explain what is this horizontal and vertical horizontal distribution is something that a state takes care of your needs right from the all ages of a life you know when you are children you get these services when you are young person you get these services when you are working person you get this when you are old this you know it give, it spreads across to a life cycle stage you know horizontally whereas vertically also is important in you know, across all classes and all you know ages and all uh, races so both we need social insurance is primarily designed for horizontal redistribution social insurance you have a uh, working you know a life you have a old life you have uh, uh, you have uh, non productive or you are still a child so social insurance is primarily designed for a horizontal redistribution seeking to reallocate income across the life cycle whereas vertical distribution is what we need, aim for in 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 addressing poverty or in you know, a social class so you can see uh, uh, ron 3 a pioneering work on po poverty emphasizes the horizontal dimension across the life cycle citizens face alternate periods of want and plenty alternate periods of want and plenty maybe when you are a child your needs and wants are more when you are working when you are earning you have maybe plenty of resources to spend again you become old your productivity comes down your needs may increase so when you want to address the poverty cycle you need to remember this and that's what he says uh uh uh, uh, uh pioneering work uh, uh, you need to these policies the policies need to you know recognize this they should emphasize you know the horizontal dimension his conclusions however suggested that a need for a vertical redistribution of resources in a particular state the later represents yeah basically you know the 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 horizontal uh, uh, distribution is you know taking from one person or taking from one source to distribute to other the degree of vertical distribution is given by the progressivity of tax system and by the degree to which social expenditures go disproportionately to the less the least well off what is this mean as we started to say i mean we beginning uh, we 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 began with saying that a uh, welfare states you know redistribute how do they redistribute by horizontal and vertical hmm horizontal redistribution and vertical redistribution between groups social insurance is primarily designed for horizontal distribution what is social insurance we we, we just you know looked at the bismarck or the or the german model it's a horizontal distribution seeking to reallocate income across life cycle when you are 80 years old i think you you need more money or more services you know it spends that much when you are 50s you're still working maybe you know your uh, income and your uh, needs are different so it allocates you know a different so that's what i think they have done in that that, that picture also you know he worked for uh, 24 years is he he contributed whatever pension but he is now 84 he retired at 50 or whatever so actually he is living more than what he contributed he contributed for the pensions for 24 years but now he is living beyond 24 years so someone else is actually spending for your pension now so that you know they may get you know their pension by someone else so the the, the with the increasing the life expectancy 
you know it is also has an implication on that so your horizontal distribution should also should take in into consideration of these aspects that's what horizontal you know uh, 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 redistribution whereas vertical redistribution uh, across the life cycle citizens face alternate periods of want and plenty his conclusions however suggested that need for vertical distribution to address the poverty the degree of vertical redistribution is given by the progressivity of the tax system No, it, 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 it allows you the uh, vertical, you know, whether you are uh, working or not, you will be covered. Whereas horizontal, you know, in your life cycle, if you are working, if you are paid, you know, so that, that's what uh, uh, it means. Social insurance covers the horizontal, you know, like you as a person, you uh, as a working, you, you have earned this much, you have contributed this much, so it covers your needs. Whereas, for example, uh, disability or uh, women you know uh, or um, other kind of risks you know you need vertical uh, 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 redistribution because you have sometimes uh, a lot sometimes nothing that's what it says so to me vertical distribution is you know i think the very vertical itself suggests that it cuts across all classes sections all ages all you know uh, 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 class structures so you need that, not just horizontal distribution. Horizontal redistribution is easy. You are working, you have worked this much, you have earned this much, you, your pension is this much, you, are, you know, we can calculate and then, then, then provide. Whereas a progressive view of the tax system, uh, the more, more, progress, more advanced tax system should be able to, you know, um, help you with the vertical redistribution, which is a must to alleviate poverty and then basically a better social policy and by the degree to which social expenditures go disproportionately to the least well off you know you are least well off but you spend more on them basically you know so this is another you know kind of idea that we can uh, use while we are talking about um, conceptualizing uh, welfare states or understanding welfare states better there are these four dimensions that we discussed for example, I just want to show once again the level of change. When we are talking about level of change, we are talking about change in paradigms, changing in institutions, change in policies, change in expenditures, uh, change in outcomes. You know, there are a lot of things that we can, we can look at and to capture the level of change that took place in a particular country or a particular region in a, in a particular period. We also can uh, find out the direction of the change by retrenchment policies, decommodification, or something else you know maybe you know what kind of direction the change is taking place whether it is more horizontal you know uh, redistribution or it is more vertical or it is both mix you know so what direction the, the social policy is taking you know we can find out that what dynamics of change is it abrupt incremental is it sudden it's it's more progressive you know who are all involved as I said you know who are all the policy actors you know all that if we study, we will be able to find out the very dynamics of the change and the degree of the change is I think also very important whether it is transformative or it is maintaining. Is it really transforming the whole structure or it is just maintaining that status quo, it is reproducing the social class, social structure or it is really transformative. You know, some countries I think they are going for this, you know, maybe Singapore they, they went for this in the beginning when they were beginning the, when they were restructuring or re building their country after the after the after the separation from malaysia for example or, or after the after the british uh, uh, colony so we can we can conceptualize or better conceptualize using some of these ideas studying some of these ideas if you see france for example they've got a lot of ideas from uh, germany you know the model is solidarity and insertion you know uh, a french model for example what we mean by solidarity and insertion social production in france is based on the principle of solidarity you know giving you know sharing uh, you know when creating social security france initiated more a bismarckian system the insurance for workers 
than the beverage one, the widespread you know, poverty. Beverage wants to cover for everyone. The national health insurance, the national health coverage for everyone. It's a widespread solidarity, you know. Everyone is included, the universal coverage. Whereas this market model, we saw, you have a location in your public and your labor market and your advantages comes with your location, your work, your achievement, your performance. Whereas France has done both. It's a solidarity and insertion. How the, what is what we mean by insertion? It not only followed Bismarck and later they also you know followed the, 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 the universal coverage. That's what I mean. Since 1970s, this pattern of solidarities has been supplemented by insertion or social inclusion designed to bring excluded people into the net. You are not paying, you are old, you, you have not contributed enough to the social fences, but still you are covered, you are included, you are inserted into the, into the solidarity model. French social production system is gradually becoming universal, covering all individuals. We can, we can also look into this. The French and German systems offer a differential protection according to one's position in the labor market. I mean, this is keep coming. You can see that. French later, you know, added the insertion, included people, but still, you know, guided by the Bismarckian, you know, model, you know. Your location in the labor market, your social class, your, you know, uh, contribution to the, to the funds matters. The French and German systems offer a differential protection, a protection, a coverage, benefits all different uh, according to your, your, your one's own position in, in the labor market. Why, why I'm introducing this? Again, you know, you can see the level of change and you know, how the French system is actually, you know, uh, uh, shifting towards the universal coverage by including people, the insertion, just not solidarity, but also uh, uh, insertion. Sweden, that's what I have seen. I think this is where, you know, I want to kind of uh, need your attention. The institutional redistributive model the, or social democratic model. Swedish model can be seen as an ideal form of welfare state. Why it is an ideal? Because, you know, it wants to cover everyone. It offers institutional care in the sense that it offers universal minimal, you know, needs, universal coverage to all its citizens. It goes further than the British model in its commitment to social equality. You know, you can see that in the, you know, the, the, the policy regarding the immigrants, the policy regarding, you know, the women and it's their employment, their needs, for example, the gender equality, gender questions, and all these you know, human rights issues also have been taken care into the Swedish model. Titmus, for example, in, the, in his institutional redistributive model, combines the principles of comprehensive social provision with the egalitarianism. As I, I said, the whole, the idea of welfare state starts with egalitarian you know, regions, whereas then you kind of started experimenting with many other models and you have um, you know economics you have economic development as a main principle so basically testmus the institutional redistributive model talks about principles of comprehensive social provision like health insurance for everyone at the same time social equality or egalitarianism you can see that french model solidarity and insertion you know so you can see all these you know combinations Whereas Sweden, you know, kind of took the middle path or the, you know, they say the middle way because in the mid 20th century, Sweden was presented as an attempt to find a middle way between capitalism and socialism. You saw that in the, in the, in the, in the video also. The capability to combine measures to promote productivity in the markets, the industrial achievement, performance, Bismarck model, whatever you, you say that, with the preventive social policies, you know, universal coverage, uh, uh, solidarity. So it, it, it combines both capitalistic and socialistic features. Strong intervention state, you see that, and also an alternative labor market policies. Even women, you know, the highest number of women employment, I think uh, you see in, the, in, in, in Sweden, and universalistic welfare measures. A strong state, active labor force, which from the Bismarck, you know, the, that model, and universalistic social. Uh, 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 welfare reforms and that's what Swedish model that's why you know in the literature we we see this is an ideal model or a or a social democratic model if you see the the population it is uh, growing of course but it's also stable from uh, 1960s the, the the golden age for the welfare state somewhere 7 million to now 9.4 or 9.5 
million with one million immigrants basically it's one third of malaysia in that way you know malaysia is about 27 million so it's about 9 million with a lot of immigration population the life expectancy uh, at birth is about 82 years on average 84 years for women uh, 80 years for men so on average it 82 years so you can understand if they work till 58 they must have contributed so say they must have started working from 30 or 35 35 to you know 50 80 60 and then they live till 82 80 84 years so you know these these figures are very important when you calculate the social pensions and pension system the total health spending accounted for 10 percent of the gdp in sweden in 2009 so they spend a lot of money on health care if you compare with united kingdom for example this is what it looks like the population the growth you know in united kingdom now it is about 67 or 65 million population with again immigrants refugees you know the, the, the curve goes like that whereas in Sweden you can see you know it's still below 10 million people it also uh, very important when it comes to you know the social policies that uh, we see the reforms and uh, Sweden also as we saw in the, uh, in the video the, the reforms took place there were this financial crisis three financial crises they were referring to I think 1990s Remember, there were three financial crises, they said. Or, so, during that time, the so social spending was cut. You can see, if, if, if you see the Sweden in that, in, that, in, that, in, that, in that chapter, they divided into three main eras. The, lower, uh, the liberal reform era, the people's home reform era, and the middle class reform era, and the transition to post-industrial era. I think there are four eras, you know, 1930s to, say, uh, 2000. There are four major uh, periods that we can see in Sweden I am now back to again Sweden so liberal reform era basically they say I mean the, the classic you know reference is that the very the, 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 the beginning of the welfare state in Sweden starts or initiated fra, right from the social democrat party uh, entry into the government in 1930s and they came into power 1932 I think they were in power till say 70s or 80s you can see that here somewhere I think they were promoting um, universal coverage or whatever social democratic policies and middle class reform era in 1950s and 70s this is the golden age of welfare states and transition to post industrial era in the last two, two decades of 20th century that is 1990s and uh, uh, till year 2000 how do we conceptualize a welfare state and what what we need to conceptualize what are the tools what are the ideas you know what, what literature you know can help us to conceptualize hmm? after this class do you think when you read about welfare state when you refer you know this literature uh, whether it is Swedish or Australia or New Zealand or US how, you know what help will you take you know to come to, to have a your own conceptualization what we did today to conceptualization there are many ways one is to look at the change the you know there are different kinds even to study change we need the level of change the degree of change the direction of the change you know that is one way what else we have seen the very origins of the welfare state egalitarian whatever you know what else the social structure stratification that we can also look into this how what access you know how social class and its access to the welfare services and what what kind of you know mixture it will it will uh, it will produce we can also look into that what else commodification decommodification or recommodification they're talking about we also that also can help us and then this welfare pluralism you know how people survive how people you know uh, in a particular country even if it's Sweden how are they you know what kind of mechanisms they're using what is the tax system you know so if you look at these things I think at the end you you will be able to uh, have your own idea your own conceptualization I'm sure